Wow, what a, a good time this morning. And uh, I, I trust that you grab on to uh, the, uh, the prophetic sense of what God is doing in, in this time. Because we really don't have uh, too many um, lighthouses out there. And if you know the reference to a lighthouse and its significance, uh, particularly in and around the coast, when you're trying to navigate difficult waters, they put those lighthouses in the strategic locations that they do to keep people from ending up on the rocks, uh, shipwrecked. And I know that uh, there are a lot of voices out there that are declaring this is what you need to be focusing on, this is what you need to be walking in. And I'm not discounting the fact that, that some of those things have have uh, good thoughts, connections to it. Uh, but if it's void of God, it is void and should be voided. Uh, because uh, it's only what carries God's fingerprints on whatever it is that is going to prevail is going to succeed. And I know at times we, we experience God's fingerprints on our lives and, and through circumstance and situation and sometimes through some of our own decisions, we, we seem to lose the sense of that, that uh, touch. He, he doesn't seem to be as real as maybe he once was. And I just believe that God is restoring. Uh, even as I, I believe that he spoke to us this morning. We need to recognize in whose image we have been created. Because we're not fashioned by human hands. Even though we may have a, a natural mother and father. The fact is that when you become born again there is a whole new you. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if any person be in Christ, they are a new creation. Amen. And uh, that does not have the same uh, definition. That word creation does not have the same definition as the word made. Creation means that you start with nothing and make it into something. Made is a term referencing having something to work with and then voila, it's, it turns into something else. And I'm, I'm again not discounting the fact that there's a certain amount of makeover that we can experience. But it's only God who can change what is the basic um, foundation and the basic image of that. And he is in the business of doing that because I believe that he doesn't want it to come as a shock when either he comes again or we die, that we stand before him. It won't come as a shock to either one of us as to how much we don't look like him because we will look like him. And I have to continue to remind myself because so much of what we experience in this life wants every day and every way to transform us away from God's image. And thereby doing uh, not only an injustice to our faith, but an undermining of our faith. And we have the word of God as a lighthouse to us to keep us anchored, to keep reminding us, not only of who God is, but also to remind us whose we are, not just who we are. And so I want to encourage you this morning, even the family that stood up here, and, and I appreciated all the other family members that were here as well, and, 
and and I just uh, especially to to uh, uh, Mike and uh, and the other bookend on on this side, Henry. I just uh, I just saw that as two bookends, and I thought, boy, whatever you put in the middle of that, it's going to be protected on both ends. So I was glad that they're in this house, and uh, but I was just encouraged to see that and. And I know that influence from both sides uh, are there, and I believe that that, that line is going to continue to grow. So uh, again, I want to underscore the fact that God is speaking prophetically to us today, and we don't want to lose sight of what he's saying. I want to continue this morning with what I started last week. We don't have a whole lot of time left, but I do want to touch on some key points. I trust you remember the scripture that we were in. If you're new with us for the first time or were not here last week, we're in the book of 1 Peter uh, chapter 5 and uh, working through verses 5 through 11. The title of the message last week, Keeping Your Guard Up, uh, that is part one. Today will be obviously part two. We know in, uh, in the realm of sports, especially in boxing, if you don't keep your guard up, you're going to get your head knocked off and maybe more serious damage than that. Well, I think as that manifests in a symbolic way to show us how important it is to keep our guards up, we need to be even more aware of the necessity to do that spiritually. And that, again, is not a manifestation of our know-how in terms of either the, the, the literal boxing or understanding the tricks and ploys of our adversary whose design is to uh, try to defeat us. We need to understand that we do not fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And those principalities and powers have one thing in mind, and that's to remove you from the very notion of what was imparted prophetically this morning, uh, the very notion that you were created in the image of a conqueror. You were created in the image of a victor and not a victim. We need to grab a hold of that. and. I, from time to time, have to shake myself that it's not position that gives you authority, it's relationship that gives you authority. How many times you've heard me say over the years, uh, if you have any doubt as to whose image you've been created in, uh, all you need to do is stand in front of the mirror and listen to what the mirror is trying to tell you. The fact is that it'll try to convince you that what you see does not matter. But as I've taught you to stand in front of the mirror and say, mirror, mirror on the wall, you're the biggest liar of them all. Because it can only reflect one dimension. And the Bible already tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.23 that we are made up of spirit, soul, and body. So we are triune in nature, and that shouldn't come as a shock. When in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, it says, uh, let us make man in our image, and it isn't God talking to the angels. If you will, it's God talking to himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, triune in nature. And you have to be reminded of that, lest you settle for less power and, and less life than what God has planned for you and I. So I have to stand in front of the mirror sometimes and tell the mirror, don't talk to me because you're a liar. And I'm going to tell you who I am. And it may sound as though you're talking to yourself, but... If God can say, let us make man in our image, and we know in essence he's talking to himself, 
because he's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, then I made it in his image. It's okay for me to talk to myself. So you need to tell yourself this morning, keep your guard up. Talk to yourself. Keep your guard up. I want to continue, as I said, in 1 Peter chapter uh, 5, and I want to begin at verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. This word care, and if you have the new uh, King James Version, the Spirit-Filled Life Bible, Pastor Jack Hayford, the editor, chief editor, there is a word wealth note there that is, is worth its weight in gold. Because as it translates this uh, Greek word, Meriimna, uh, it says that it's from the basic word, which means to divide, and the rest of that word, the mind. So, as it says, the word denotes distractions, anxieties, and worries. The word denotes distractions, anxieties, burdens, and worries. I don't know about you, but I can readily identify with at least two or three of those things, if not all of them. But here's really what caught my eye. The word means to be anxious beforehand about daily life. How many have been anxious beforehand? How many have ever heard the old adage, things are okay now, but I'm waiting for the other? What on earth does a dropping shoe have to do with anything? I'm sure whoever came up with it had a purpose but what it translates for me is that in terms of what is built into life, there's already a predisposition to worry. Why pray when you can worry? For many people, worry is much more effective to keep you anchored in your situation. Maybe tied down is a better word than faith. Because faith does not talk about where you are. Faith talks about where you can be. And so there's something that has to happen inside of us. Well, it's this notion that I've got to cast these things on him. Why? Because he cares for us. And the very essence of casting is not like the notion of casting as if you are fishing where the reel is in your hand and the line is going to remain connected to the reel and also connected to the hook in hopes that whatever you hook, you can reel in. In biblical terms, it means, and I might just use it in that graphic representation, that when you cast it, you throw the pole too. You let go of the whole thing. Lord, I'm casting this on you. Foof! He can dodge the flying reel and still catch the hook. You can still hook God by faith and he can respond to you. I love that definition. means to be anxious beforehand. Have you ever heard anyone, and, and we were talking a couple of weeks ago with someone whose name escapes me at the moment. Uh, my remember will probably help me. Uh, but we were talking with someone, and we were talking about our, our testimony and, and the things that we say. And, and how important are they in the scheme of life? And, and can there be anything that, that would 
uh, happen to you as a result of what you say. Now, now I want to be careful about uh, using this in a way that, oh my gosh, if I step on a crack, I'm going to break my mother's back and all the superstition that goes along with that kind of nonsense. But, but there is something. There is something about what you speak. There is something that can affect you by the things that come out of your mouth. I can forget, but I can, I'll never forgive. I can forgive, but I'll never forget. Now, that isn't a prayer that's welcoming Alzheimer's as your solution to forgetting. But the reference I made a moment ago to hearing someone say, you know, I went to the doctor and, and I didn't know what was going on. The doctor can't figure it out, and I just know it's cancer. Uh, how do you know it's cancer? Well, I just know that it is. And that's the thing that keeps coming out of their mouth. And we were talking with a couple where they, this person was saying, you know, I just know I'm going to die of a brain tumor. From the time that they were young, they were going to die of a brain tumor. And you couldn't convince them otherwise. Do you remember who that was? We were talking with someone. Okay. They were telling us about somebody we didn't know. Yeah, they were telling us about somebody we didn't know. And, and they said, you know what? They, he died of a brain tumor. But then the next generation came along professing the same thing. And they died of a brain tumor. Now you say, Pastor, you need to understand scientifically that it's in the genes. I understand genetics to a degree. But I think that there are also spiritual genetics that we need to give attention to. And if we're created in the image of God, and nothing was created by, or, or something was created from nothing by a word. That's Genesis, in case you're wondering about the biblical reference to nothing being there and then something being created. You can read that in Genesis chapter 1. It was created by what? A word. So if we're created in his, his image, how important is it that one of our guards is uh, guarding what comes out of our mouth? I will never forgive. I can guarantee you, if you say that long enough, you will never forgive. Well, I can't. No. That's not the issue. The issue is you won't. Because somehow this is providing a measure of strength for you to keep you going. Unfortunately, it's keeping you going in the wrong direction. So when you cast your cares upon him, you give it all. You know why? So the provision of what you're doing does not cause you to begin to worry beforehand. Doesn't the scripture encourage us to not worry about when? Tomorrow, for sufficient are the evils of today. Well, how am I going to be prepared if I don't worry about tomorrow? Well, you pick up your Bible and you turn to Matthew chapter 6 and you read it again. Just like the disciples asked, teach us to pray, not how to pray. Just teach us to pray. Okay, you begin with this. Our Father who art in heaven. I'm obviously in King James language. Your name is holy. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. He has built everything into that. He is identifying where your source is, but he's also identifying 
what you should be praying. Thy kingdom come. Do you know what that means? You've heard me say it before, but it bears repeating. Don't pray that at bedtime. It is not a bedtime prayer. It's a warfare prayer. So if you want to stay up all night, pray, thy kingdom come. Because what that means is whatever kingdom is in place and you're asking God for his kingdom to come, guess what? There is conflict on the way. And you'll see how it's tied to your words in just a moment. When you pray, thy kingdom come, those are words that you're speaking. Do you know what that means when you pray? It means that you are giving permission for the God of all creation to remove whatever kingdom exists in you before he gets rid of the kingdom around you. And I'll tell you what, I know in the limited life that I've had on the earth, I know that the kingdom inside of me is a whole lot stronger than the kingdom around me. Do you know in terms of supernatural strength and power, the devil is not second? It's God, my will, and the devil. And my will is suspended between the two. God won't go against my will and Satan can't. It has to be yielded in either direction. I am powerful. When you recognize who you are in God, not who you are in yourself, you can, you can subscribe to the notion as it records in Scripture, by my God, I can run through a troop and leap over a wall. Amen. Well, let me tell you something. Don't go trying to run through troops and leap over walls unless God tells you to do it. Because it's only an exercise of your own understanding, which is futile. But if he tells you, you're going to go right through the troop and you're going to sail over the wall. So what does it have to do with this keeping your guard up? Because this casting your cares upon him is critical to the transformation of your spirit in terms of where your dependence is. Some trust in chariots, Psalm 20, I believe it's verse 12. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. When his name is lifted high, everything else is below. When I am lifted high, I just become a more visible target for the enemy. And mostly to get me to reflect on the benefits of living for myself. I want to know how to fight, but I want to know how to win. Amen. I do not want to engage in a fight when I know I'm going to get the snarf beat out of me. I want to discover the tactics that my enemy is not aware of. So that when he thinks he's dealing that final blow, I can look up and say, I have you right where I want you. You're an idiot, Pastor. Well, a victorious idiot. So what are we to be on guard for? Verse 8. After we've given these things to the Lord, he said, be sober, and that does not refer to drinking. It refers to a mindset, a dedication, whereby... We are self-controlled. Now, I want to be careful with the word self in the control aspect of it. It does not mean 
that that control is under my administration and I'm partnering with God. If I've given it all to him, then what it means to be self-controlled is everything who argues for my attention that wants to distract me from the things that he's speaking to me, I take control of those things and I cast them away from me because I'm only going to believe him. That's what self-controlled means. Psalm 32 and verse 8 tells us, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. When you're self-controlled, you're focused on God. And he doesn't have to hit you with a two by four to get you to change direction or to get you on the right course. He can direct you with his eye. Parents, how many know that it is wonderful when you take your little shavers into somebody else's house? That's a Greek word for children, shavers. And you take them into someone else's house and you give them the talk before you go. How many parents have ever done that? When you go in, don't touch anything. Yes, mommy. Yes, daddy. And as soon as they hit the door, your words are a faint memory. They may be reminded later on when you leave, but... And it'll become more real to them because you'll apply some pressure to their seat of learning. Uh, anyway, isn't it wonderful when you can sit in the house and they're all set, sitting there on the couch where you placed them 45 minutes ago and they're just sitting there with their little hands folded, their hair all nice and combed, big smiles on their face. And, Mommy, Daddy, may I have some water? Yes, just a moment, please. We're talking. Okay, I'll wait. <laughs> and then they start to move, and you don't even have to say a word. You just give them a little. <laughs> they know exactly what it means. Don't you feel good as a parent that you don't even have to say a word? You can just direct them with your eye. Well, that did not originate with Adam and Eve. It originated with God. See, if you've cast all your cares upon Him, He's basically your director. He's basically the one that leads you into all ways. As you are self-controlled, you're resisting every other temptation. And you're watching for his eye. Verse 9 of that Psalm 32 says, Don't be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding. How many people from Missouri do we have here? Oh, a few. Thank you, Michael. How many know how you get a Missouri mule's attention? It's well known. You hit him in the head with a two by four. I don't know if that's animal abuse or how that came about, but, but we could probably put Missouri in here. Don't be like the Missouri mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle. Look at this. I don't know how many times I've read this scripture and, and really not followed the thought all the way to the end. I don't know how many times I've looked at this and I've, I've thought, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle to get them to do what you want them to do. Look what it says. Which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. And I said, Lord, what exactly does that mean for me? He says, when you are not being directed by my eye, you want to stay out of arm's reach. 
Not just for the issue of correction, but for the issue of identification to be just like me. And if you are like the horse or the mule, you have difficulty getting close. I said, Lord, there's times when I have difficulty getting close. Why? Because I've dropped my guard in this area. It says to be vigilant, which means to be watchful. How do people of faith watch? By hearing. By hearing, not by seeing. They watch by hearing. One of the things that I realized as I would read the Word of God is there are things that God doesn't like. Did you know that? Now, before we come up with our list, you might want to look at his list. Because I found some very interesting things in his list. How many know that God hates sin? How many times have we heard that you can love the sinner and what? And if we're created in God's image, then that's how he is. He hates the sin, but he loves the sinner. 1 John 3, 16. Tells us in Romans, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God hates sin. I never really looked at the fact that sometimes he hates the person that is committing the sin. Oh, pastor, that's dangerous. Well, let me give you a reference. Maybe we can even put that up if you can find it back there. Whoever's operating the overhead. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 12 through 19. I think this is critical in being on guard. We've been talking, or I've been talking, you've been hopefully following in the word about what comes out of our mouth. We're to be watchful. We're to listen. We're to love what God loves and hate what God hates. But I want you to look at Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 12 through 19. Do you have that there? If it's not on the screen, possibly you have it in your Bible or your iPad, iPhone. I don't know how many times I've read this and I didn't realize the full implication. I'm going to start with verse 12. A worthless man, a wicked man, walks with a perverse mouth. He winks with his eyes, he shuffles his feet, he points his finger. Perversity is in his heart. He devises evil continually, he sows discord. Therefore his calamity shall come suddenly. Suddenly he shall be broken without remedy. These six things the Lord hates. I didn't write it. Are you reading with me? Verse 16. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look. A lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who bears lies, and one. Notice it doesn't talk about the sin, it talks about the person who sows discord 
among brethren. God hates people who sow discord. Does it say he hates the sin? It says these seven things he hates. A person who sows discord. Why? Because it causes division. Why? Because that's the devil's territory. And if we're not operating in the image of God, we can be operating in the self-image. That's why the Bible says be self-controlled. May I change the words around a little bit and say it means to control yourself. The tendency that would be in, in a man in terms of their humanity, which, by the way, the authorship of your humanity, not humanness, but the tendency to operate like Adam and Eve did not come from God. It came from that other influence in the garden. Do you know that? When it tells us in 1 Peter to be on guard, it's saying you need to understand how he operates. He sows discord. And how does he do that? By not being self-controlled. Because the devil, as we read on in verse 8, because your adversary, the devil, your adversary, the devil, does that make it clear that he is your adversary? But do you know he will try to present himself as your advocate? Do you know that's what he did with Eve in the garden? When God said, he just took those three words, God has said, and interchanged them and turned a statement into a question. So when he presented himself to Eve, he took the three words and he says, has God said? The implication is, if God is a good God and he loves you and wants the best for you, why would he withhold anything in the garden from you? And that sounds believable and plausible. So all of a sudden, your adversary becomes an advocate. Why? Because the things you've been listening to were not controlled. There was no guard against it. And you begin to echo the things that you're hearing that is not being given by God. Now I hope in these last few moments that I have this morning that that can penetrate us. Not to condemn us or confuse us, but to really realize he's not my friend. And these thoughts in my mind that have in any way a divisive character to it is not God, no matter how plausible or how believable it may sound. Have you ever walked into a room and the notion comes to you that there was chatter going on in the room until you walked in and it stopped and you knew the reason why it stopped? Anybody here with me today? I know why it stopped. Not because I'm just this gorgeous presence that walked into the room, but because they were talking about me. <laughs> and nobody can tell you otherwise. Pastor Vivian spoke to a young lady one time that sort of had that feeling that uh, they just don't like me. 
They're all thinking about me. And she just, with the wisdom that only she possesses, says, honey, I don't want to deflate your balloon, but they have better things to think about than you. Well, you might say Said it a little different. What? It was our own daughter, so. Yeah. <laughs> Take that from the tape, please. I wouldn't say that just No, she, she has a lot of wisdom. The point is, if you begin to agree with that thought, you'll have a problem with every person in the room. Half of which like you. Well, 25% that like you. Well, actually just one. Jesus. And it all started with what? Listening to something that caused you to begin to profess something out of your mouth, whether it was vocalized or not, that you came into agreement with. Your adversary will try to be your advocate. And you got to be on guard. How many remember some of his other identifications or names? The serpent. Do you remember in Genesis what God called the devil? A serpent. What did he say to him? Well, before I tell you, I want to remind you of another place where he's identified. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. And you'll see how this ties together in just a moment. His name is Lucifer. He's the author of the five I wills. I will be like God. What does the prophet say preceding those verses? Oh, star of the morning. How you have fallen. How did you fall? Because you weren't self-controlled. You let the words of God be a reference point, not your guide. And you started focusing on what was good for you, not good for God. And the end is, not only did he fall, but the scripture tells us he took a third of the angels with him. Numbers chapter 16, another testimony of someone who had tremendous influence. Korah, who was one of the priestly servants, who was able to get the ear of 250 leaders of Israel to stand against Moses as well as a whole bunch of other people just by his words. And it all started with Moses saying, these people are not victims, they're victors. When he was addressing the fact that they were not holy. He didn't say that God had cast them aside. He just said they got to change their ways. And this guy comes along and says, you call them unholy. I say God calls them holy. And so Moses just said, all right, tomorrow morning at noon. That's where the movie High Noon came from. He said, tomorrow at high noon, we'll settle it in the streets. There'll be a line and, and we'll find out just exactly which side you're on. Those for God will stand on my side. Those for you will stand on the other side. The Bible says that the ground opened up and swallowed them. You mean 250 liters bit the dust just because they listened? Absolutely. 
They let their guard down and they believed a lie. They believed a false report. They made an accusation that they should have never made and the result was they lost their lives. The ground opened up. But I wanna, want you to see, if you will, with me for just a moment, a little bigger picture of, of not just waiting for an earthquake to come to shock your neighbors, but to realize what the symbolism of that is because it's earth quaking. It's earth, it's dust. And what does the Bible say when in Genesis it refers through God's words when he addresses the serpent, he says, you will crawl on your belly all the days of your life and your food will be dust. Where were we created from? Dust. Let me help you for just a moment. Do you know what that means? If we are called flesh, i.e. dust, and that's what the enemy has permission to eat. God gave him that permission. Do you know that wherever flesh is present, the devil has a God-approved authority and permission to come and eat all he wants. And there's nowhere in the Bible there's no doctrine I've ever researched that God has ever rescinded that. So wherever there is flesh, lack of self-control, the devil has permission to operate. And his operation is to get you to buy into the five I wills plan. So you can cast self-control aside and be the con in control of your own destiny. The church, that's you and I. We need to be on guard. When we see our brother or sister overtaken in a fault, that's why I loved what was up here and all the families that were here. Because I absolutely subscribe to the notion that it takes a village to raise a child. We've got into this nonsense that the world offers, don't touch my kid. Well, let me tell you something before you get into all of that kind of defensive stuff. That kid was God's kid before he was ever your kid. And you know what? God touches him all the time. But when he can no longer touch him and his fingerprints are not there, he becomes... He becomes a register for another fingerprint. And I'll tell you what, I'd rather see a faint, a faint sign of the fingerprints of God on my kid's life than an indelible print of the world that says you're your own person. Because I know where they're going, not just hell. But I know that they're headed for shipwreck. And if they just raise their guard up a little bit and say, you know what, all these thoughts that are going on in my mind is not mine. They're not mine. As soon as you take ownership of your thoughts, you're already toward the five I will program. Because he wants you to think about you being the center of your universe. And as soon as you do, you displace God. Well, I love seeing this family because I, I just was overtaken by the thing that I, I think those family members are going to help raise those kids. You know, a lot of us could be saved from a lot of grief if somebody who knows something about my kid would have the courtesy to pick up the phone and call me and say, I saw your kid thus and such. And I don't go, oh, wait a minute. I say, thank you. And then I go get my kid. I say, we're going to have a talk. We're going to have a talk. 
Who told you? How about start with God told me, but he just used the messenger to do it because he loves you more. He loves wanting to preserve his plan for your life more than he wants to sign on with your plan because your plan is going to end in destruction. I'd want somebody to tell me, yeah, but if, if, if I tell them I'm going to lose the friendship, if that's all that is holding your friendship together is your displaced loyalty, you might as well throw it away before it really hurts you. See, the Bible says faithful are the wounds of a friend. You know why? Because my friends know where the spot is in me that needs to get gotten to. My enemy hasn't figured it out yet. He just stabs me anywhere. But those that love you and are closest to you can take a hat pin and just walk the foof. Oh, oh, gosh, I didn't think you'd say that to me. Well, you got some stuff going on that needs to change. Well, you're not my friend. No, actually, that's the true test. Because I'm telling you, because I love you. And I don't want to see you going that way. That's being on guard. That's helping. The church has the truth. We'll get to the how you love one another a little later. Not today. But it says love one another fervently. You know what fervent means? It means you're hot. Not just the person you're loving, but that you're intense to keep them safe in your love. Last Sunday when I started in verse 5, it refers to the issues of submission, but I put that under the umbrella of something bigger. Because it says to be submissive one to another. And I just gave it the, the identification of maintaining connection. And this is how we do it. You gotta, you gotta touch one another. If you don't get touched or touch, you lose perspective. Because then the enemy just tells you, you know what, it's really all about you. And the only way you're gonna get through is you gotta keep it that way. You can't trust anybody and you can't even trust yourself. But when you touch somebody, it starts bringing perspective back. Wow. Other people have suffered. Other people are going through things. I just need somebody to touch me. Well, you're getting that wish right now. And I'm going to pray that that touch is going to be everything that you needed this morning. Because I pray that the word has touched your heart. Father, I just ask right now that each and every person who's in this room would receive something of you today that they take away from this time. And I already bind any thoughts that would suggest that this is in any way condemning. I do not receive condemnation Condemnation cannot be given. It can only be received just like rejection. And I reject rejection. There is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Even when we hear corrective things, there is no condemnation. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, he corrects. And I receive the correction, Lord, if I've lowered my guard and allowed even some of my thoughts to go down corridors that, that do not have 
unity as the focus and are divisive. May I take the encouragement from the Psalms that says, I said I will guard my ways lest I sin with my tongue. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Father, we want to be in your image. To speak the things that you speak so that we can see the results that came from your speaking be results that follow our speaking. And Lord, we just even choose now as we touch that person on either side or, or if it's just one side, we pray for them, Lord. And we say, may your words today be healing to their lives, deliverance to their souls. And may my hand be a touch that communicates, not only are we in this together, but I love you. And I love you with an unconditional love. A love that is unconditional yet transformational. And Lord, we just want to be what you want us to be. We want to reflect you so that the glory may be evident to all. We bless that person in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.